Okay, we're here today with Dr. Stanley Krippner, the noted author, researcher, experimentalist, teacher, and uh, roving ambassador around the world, and a very good friend of Parapsychology Foundation, and the administrators of the foundation, Eileen J. Garrett, my maternal grandmother and the founder of the foundation, Eileen Coley, and me as the third generation. So in reference to our 65th year of uh, of being in operation. Stan has uh, survived all the generations within Parapsychology Foundation, and as such, I'd like to ask you a few questions as to your uh, association with the Foundation. So, but first, how would you say you got interested in parapsychology? Well, my interest in parapsychology goes really back to my childhood, because when I was about the age of 12, I was really eager to get a set of encyclopedia that my aunt was selling as a salesperson. And they were $100, which was like a fortune to my family, which were farmers. And I never got the encyclopedia. And I was thinking to myself, who do I know that has money that I could borrow money from to get that set of encyclopedia? I thought, well, my Uncle Max, he's the one rich me member of the family. My Uncle Max, I thought, well, I'll try to get some money from him. Just as I was thinking that, there was a phone call downstairs in our farmhouse, and my mother answered the phone, and she began to scream and cry while her brother-in-law had just died of a massive heart attack at a fairly early age of 40-something. And I was in such shock that I had been thinking of him just before the phone call came in that I didn't tell anybody about that for years. But I began to read about parapsychology. And then of all things, I began to listen to the Dunninger radio show. Joseph Dunninger was a mentalist who used the typical mentalist techniques and procedures and tricks to give the illusion that he was reading newspapers in advance of the publication, that he would pick up on thoughts of people in the audience. And this is something that was really making uh, quite a good radio show. Years later, I actually met Dunninger. And by that time, I knew that he probably had little of any authentic psychic ability, but nonetheless was a very good showman and in so doing, that triggered my ongoing interest in parapsychology. One might say that for any important life decision, there is a precursor or a preliminary set of experiences. There's an activating experience, and then there's maintaining experiences. So in my case, the groundwork was all laid by my experience with my Uncle Max having the coincidence of me thinking about him while my mother was about to get the sad phone call, and then the activating uh, procedure was all of these radio shows that took me into reading about the topic, popular magazines about the topic, and then the maintaining is when I actually began to get involved myself and my involvement in parapsychology took a very unusual form. I was an amateur magician, and so I added, added mentalism tricks to my magical repertoire, and I was allegedly reading the minds of people um, in my little audience of relatives, friends, and peers in high school, and was reading through blindfolds and was doing some suggestive work, not quite hypnosis, but along those same lines. And so all of that happened well in advance of the uh, formal introduction to parapsychology, which happened at the University of Wisconsin when I was an undergraduate. And this was when I still thought that Dunninger had, had powers and I was the head of the student speakers committee. And I said, why don't we bring Joseph Dunninger 
And some of my show business friends, well, don't you realize this is all a magical trick? He's a mentalist. You know, what he does is not authentic. And that came as quite a shock to me, but they explained some of the principles of mentalism. And then with my professor, Dr. A.C. Garnett, my philosophy professor, said, why don't you invite Dr. J.B. Ryan from Duke University? Because he actually does scientific studies of the things that you're interested in. So I wrote a letter to Dunninger, and he agreed to come, but we had to find the money. We went to the psychology department, and we got just nothing but hostility. The head of the psychology department said, if you invite Dr. J.B. Ryan to give a talk, you should follow that up with a lecture by Father Devine, a faith healer of the day, on recent advances in the art of medicine. He was just making fun of us. Well, our committee, most of whom had no allegiance to parapsychology and very little interest in it, were nevertheless very incensed by being made fun of and being ridiculed. And so the committee really get, got to work and corresponded with Dr. Ryan. He says, I'm going to be in Chicago to address the American Chemical Association. And so I can take a train up, if you can afford train fare, and give my lecture and then go back to Chicago. Well, that did it. And so Ryan came to lecture and again met with great hostility from the psychology department and most of the philosophy department. And he had a standing room only crowd on a cold winter's day when there were competing events. And I ended up introducing him because the student who was supposed to introduce him chickened out because it would make his psychology professor unhappy and he didn't want to take any chances. So when I introduced Dr. Ryan, of course, I had to see him to and from the train station and he invited me to visit him at Duke University. Coincidentally, I graduated in speech education and I got a job as a speech therapist in Richmond, Virginia. And so as soon as I got to Richmond, Virginia, I took a train to Duke University to Durham, North Carolina. And then that was my formal introduction to the uh, parapsychology laboratory, and then we just went on from there. Well, how did you become aware of the work of Parapsychology Foundation, which was founded in 1951 by Eileen Garrett, or were you introduced to Eileen Garrett first? Well, once I became interested in parapsychology, thanks to J.B. Ryan and his brilliant wife, Louisa E. Ryan, I was sent off to do some little expeditions for them, looking into the case of a horse in Richmond, Virginia, who had alleged psychic powers. And then once I was in graduate school, visiting an alleged poltergeist case in uh, Gutenberg, Iowa, neither one of them um, impressed me. In fact, I advanced counter arguments about the psychic phenomena supposedly associated with each of those events. And then the Parapsychology Foundation came into the picture because when I was working as a speech therapist, I was attending the meetings of the Parapsychological Association. I met Dr. Montague Ullman, and he had received some money from the Parapsychology Foundation and some other sources to start a dream laboratory to study telepathic dreams. And his very first subject was the renowned medium Eileen Garrett, the founder of the Parapsychology Foundation. And she was supposed to dream about a picture that an assistant had put into a sealed envelope in some office. And she had a remarkable series of dreams, the most vivid one of which was a scene from Ben-Hur the novel by Lewis Wallace in which the 
team of black horses is racing against the team of white horses around the Roman Coliseum. And she reported this and she said, well, you know, there's a movie that's just come out, another remake of the Ben-Hur movie, and I've got to see that movie. Well, interestingly enough, the picture in the sealed envelope was a glossy still of the chariot race from Ben-Hur, the new movie. So you don't get any better than that. This all happened before I arrived on the scene, but this is something that uh, prompted Dr. Ullman to take me to the Parapsychology Foundation to meet Eileen Garrett and the staff. And I have to say that Eileen and I hit it off right from the beginning. We became very close friends. It wasn't long before she invited me to uh, her annual meetings of the foundation in southern France, the charming little village of La Piole, and I had the great fortune of being there two summers. One summer I actually took my wife and my two stepchildren, and I have many, many wonderful memories of La Piole. Can you speak to uh, your reactions about the, the personality that was gathered, apart from her psychic functioning? Was well, yes, yes. Eileen Garrett was what I would call a force of nature. She was extremely charismatic and very opinionated, but her opinions made very good sense. And she had a rich legacy and a wonderful personal history in terms of her uh, living in southern France, her escape from the Nazis. She was Irish, of course, of descent, coming to the United States literally on a shoestring. And on the virtue of her mediumship, which she kept quiet for so many, many, many years, she began to gain favor of, shall we say, friends in high places, including a member of Congress, Francis Bolton, who bankrolled a lot of her early ventures. Also, Eileen was a very successful businesswoman back in the days when women did not run businesses. And she made shrewd investments. She ran the foundation very well, gave grants, gave scholarships. And so I saw all of this firsthand. I might say that Eileen is one of those people who had her head in the air and her feet on the ground. Yes, she could be very ethereal. I was with her when she was channeling Yuvani and her other alleged spirit guides, but I was with her when she was making very sound business decisions, deciding who to invite, who not to invite to her conferences, and she was extremely gracious to me, extremely gracious to my wife when I would introduce my wife to her, and of course at Le Piole, she was the uh, overwhelming presence, and she did invite two psychiatrists to speak, two of the psychiatrists who were doing early work with LSD, and this was LSD and alcoholism, and I noticed the, she really had a romantic crush on one of them, Arnold Ludwig, and she actually invited him back the following year the following year, he gave an unnecessarily critical evaluation of mediumship and of parapsychology, which uh, I thought was sort of biting the hand that was feeding him, and he never got invited back again. But to this day, Arnie and I are friends, and he's, shall we say, more open to psychic phenomena than other psychiatrists. But I think to save his own reputation, and seeing that the transcripts were to be published, he really had to come down a little bit heavy-handed on, on mediumship specifically and parapsychology in general. Eileen took this all with a grain of salt. So what can I say? Eileen was very, you know, she was very aggressive and very domineering, but then there was this coquette side of her, this girlish, romantic um, ingenue side of her. There was a little girl side of her, which never left. 
And I could just see her as a little girl in Ireland hearing these strange voices and having these strange and unusual experiences. And so she was, well, she had many facets, many, many sides. And of course, she had to get involved in politics. Uh, Francis Bolton was not the most, shall we say, liberal and progressive member of Congress. But Eileen handled her very well. I never had the fortune of meeting uh, her, her son, who also went into politics briefly. And I also saw how she um, handled visitors. She was extremely gracious as a hostess, extremely outgoing to visitors. And in the Lapeole conferences, where we had probably the best food that I've ever had in my life, she would greet people in the morning and she would generally greet them by saying, how did you sleep? And of course it was polite to say I slept very well, even though you might have had insomnia during the night, that would not have been a very gracious response. So I clued my stepchildren, when Eileen asks you, how did you sleep? You say, oh, we slept very well and that'll make her happy. So she was a gracious hostess. She always invited very top-notch people to the conference, had a very good sense of who would contribute something of value to the conference from different disciplines, and then had the conference proceedings printed. Uh, and most of those are still in print, and most of those can be read with great value because they were very multidisciplinary in nature. And I met some outstanding people at her conferences like uh, Walter Pankey and Humphrey Osmond, both of whom I became very close friends with. So Eileen opened up a number of social contacts for me and professional opportunities to me by inviting me to these conferences and also to the meetings that she would hold from time to time at the Parapsychology Foundation offices in New York City. Stan, I know that uh, once you told me a particular memory of a conference, I think, with uh, Dr. Lawrence Lachan, and you were doing, you were running some sort of a mediumship um, experiment with walkie-talkies, and I think Douglas Johnson, the medium, was also involved. Yes. Could you share some of that? Because I, I found that. Well, actually, I was involved in two experiments in La Piole, and I think they were two different, the two different meetings, and one of the meetings involved Walter Pankey and he wanted me to bring some sensitive film. I got some x-ray films that this time I was at Maimonides Medical Center with Dr. Montague Ullman, who had originally introduced me to Eileen Garrett to do the dream telepathy studies. And we had enough money to last for 10 years. We published 100 papers, a monograph, and a book in those 10 years, so people really got their money's worth. And so I brought some sensitive x-ray film and I, Douglas Johnson was a renowned English medium, by the way. So I had this film and I said, what Walter and I would like you to do is to try to create a psychic impression on this film. And from the part of your body that has the most energy in it. So Eileen immediately put the film to her bosom and focused on trying to get some impressions on the film that way. Douglas Johnson put his against his crotch. And so I thought, Le they always say that mediums are pretty sexy people, and that's been my experience too. Some people claim that they become psychic by abstaining from sex. Now I've known mediums that say, yeah, we have to have sex to fuel our psychic energy. And my bias is toward the latter avenue. I think that's a what produces the best results. Well, we didn't get much of anything from those films, but the other experiment that I did was much more successful. I brought a sealed envelope with me from our dream laboratory in Brooklyn, and one of our college students had prepared a picture that he chose from a uh, magazine, I believe, or from a postcard rack. And he put this in a sealed envelope, and I think he double sealed the second envelope so he couldn't hold it up to the light and get an impression, even though the envelopes were sealed, never not white, they were opaque. So 
Yuvani called upon, I, um, remember that Yuvani was one of her spirit guides, and he called upon his potentials, and he said, I see the picture, and I've written all of this up, by the way, so it's a matter of record. I see this picture, and there's a huge electrical fixture in the picture, and it's above a man, and I'm sort of worried that maybe it'll fall down and hit the man. Now, actually, the picture was a postcard from the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C., and there was an Islamic man prostrate on the floor praying, and above him was this huge chandelier. I've uh, been in the center. It's a very imposing and very beautiful chandelier, very secure, no way it could fall down and hit him. So that was a pretty good description of the picture. But then Yuvani was not finished. He said, but you know, the person who prepared the picture is of more interest to me than the picture itself. And he went on to give a description of the student, a physical description, which was absolutely perfect. And he said, he is going to be in the newspaper before you get back to San Francisco, before you get back to New York City. Other people were there from San Francisco, from Canada, from Europe, other places, but I was the one from New York City. And there will be a new member of his family before the end of the year. So I went back and I talked to the student. He was very much surprised because when I was gone, he had entered a contest. This was in the 1960s when people were wearing buttons, advertising different social goals, especially opposition to the Vietnam War, peace signs, marijuana leaves on the right, and the, and the like. And so he had designed a button called Ignore This Button, and that won first prize from the contest uh, sponsors, which were New York newspapers. So he ended up in the newspaper, just like Eileen had predicted. He will be in the newspaper before you come back. And I said, now her other prediction was that there would be a member of your family before the end of the year. And again, he was shocked. He said, well, my sister is pregnant, but nobody knows about it outside of the family. But the baby is not expected until January. I said, you have to be prepared for a Christmas birth. Sure enough, the baby came before the end of the year. So that was one of my firsthand experiences where I saw Eileen and her spirit guides come up with some statements on that simple little experiment that she knew nothing about, which were actually quite, uh, uh, quite clearly uh, evidential. At Eileen Garrett's death in 1970, did you personally worry or was the field concerned about the fate or the future of Parapsychology Foundation? Oh yes, yes, we were very concerned because the Parapsychology Foundation had done so much in the field. However, I had gotten to know Eileen Coley, her daughter, and so I wasn't worried because Eileen Coley was very sharp, very dynamic, had good judgment. She had many traits in common with Eileen Garrett. And Eileen Coley and I became good friends. I dedicated one of our books, Advances in Parapsychological Research to her. And so I personally wasn't concerned with the future of the foundation like some other of my friends were. Eileen Garrett, by the way, did make an interesting appearance <coughs> at the memorial service for a I was close friends with the seal Khan, and she had two sons, one of which, David Khan, was very much interested in parapsychology and has an outstanding reputation as a psychiatrist. And I went on behalf of him and his uh, mother, I didn't know his father very well, but Eileen was called upon to speak, and in her talk, she actually said that she was in communication with the deceased. And what was the message from the deceased? 
love Lucille, give her some support, which we all did. So that was sort of the dramatic highlight of that particular uh, memorial service. And of course, there were many, many uh, memorial services and gatherings, formal and informal, when Eileen passed away. But the Parapsychology Foundation did remain in good hands. And of course, now across the generations, with you in command, it's in uh, good hands again today, despite the financial adversities and the ups and downs of the stock markets, uh, you're hanging in there while so many other parapsychology laboratories and foundations bit the dust many, many years ago when I saw this firsthand. Well, did you also know uh, Bob Coley, uh, our administrative secretary and uh, treasurer? Oh yes, I knew Bob Coley, a lovely person, very typically French, very much of a bon vivant, and I certainly enjoyed my contact with him. I remember him from the Lapiole conferences, also from some of our contacts in New York City. And I could certainly appreciate how he and Babs, as I called her, uh, worked tandem because they were very different in terms of personalities, but he had special strengths and special abilities that he brought to keeping the foundation well-grounded, well-footed. And my time with him was just very joyous because he said such a wonderful sense of humor. And again, liked good food and good drink and uh, was never too heavy-handed, carried off his duties with a great deal of aplomb and efficiency and effectiveness. Well, were you surprised that there was a third generation in the mix and now possibly a fourth generation with my daughter Anastasia? I know you saw me sort of growing up in the foundation. Yes, of course I was, I wouldn't say I was surprised because I was well aware that that good genetic stock goes down over the uh, generations, even though the, there's no mediumship associated with it that's of paramount importance. The industry, the intelligence, the hard work, the perception, the insight is something that uh, all three of you folks have had in common. And now hopefully your daughter will be uh, adding her talents to the list. So this has been really a great joy to me. I have to say in my life, I have had other friends who I have followed over the generations. So I do have some other three generational friendships and they have been a source of just great joy because we reminisce about the previous generations and my role in interactions with them. And so this has certainly been a pleasure. In parapsychology, it's a very, very hard path to follow because there's never enough money, there's never enough support there's always plenty of criticism, plenty of hostility, plenty of demeaning comments, and plenty of ignorance. So I think that the parapsychology, by hanging in there with its uh, meetings, with its uh, monograph series, its library, its ambassadorship, has performed an invaluable service, not only to parapsychology, but the field of the study of the person in general. Uh, yes, over the three generations, the commonalities, but are there differences, were there differences in style of administration that you can speak to? Well, I would say that there are more similarities than differences. I would say that the major difference was that Eileen Garrett had the great fortune to be friends with uh, Francis Bolton and her political connections and her personal fortune. And the Parapsychology Foundation has never had a sponsor of that caliber and such hard pocketbooks and such wide generosity uh, since that time. Um, we need another one to come along to uh, be that supportive. I think that the inheritance is something that has kept the PF going. Of course, the stock market crash 
really wiped out a lot of those gains, which was unfortunate. I think that one commonality across the generations was good judgment. Um, all three of the directors, all three of the presidents have been very, very discriminatory in discriminating in terms of who they invite to the conferences, the projects that they invest in, the publications that they come out with. You take a look at the monographs and each one is solid. I can't think of one that is really off the wall. Some are better than others, but they all have something of value to offer. The conferences were attended by outstanding people, made a very big difference in the field, brought people together who otherwise would not have been able to know and meet each other. Also, the attention to students has been important, and that recently was exemplified by the group of students and professors from uh, the United Kingdom who came over and were hosted by the Parapsychology Foundation. I think that uh, I think that graciousness is another common trait. I've never known Eileen or Babs or Lissette to be mean and nasty as they well could have been in this field. And they approach their task with a delightful sense of humor. All three of these strong and lovely ladies were funny. They didn't take things all that seriously. And even Eileen Garrett, who, you know, was in communication with these alleged spirits, was asked, you know, are these spirits from the other world or are they part of your own psyche? And she said something like this. Well, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I think they're part of myself. On Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays, I think they're from the other world. And Sundays I take the day off. So she was always very speculative about where she was getting this information. And of course she came up with some stunning correspondences in terms of military disasters, in terms of historical events, uh, very, very specific information that she was able to get from her sources. Again, whether they were part of her from the other side. But you know, this is not something irreconcilable because many American Indian tribes have the concept of the long body. We do not end when our skin ends. We extend into the clan, into the family, into the tribe, into other generations, into the past, into the future. And when you take the concept of the long body, you can see that the psyche is part of a larger whole. And so it really doesn't make sense to draw lines where maybe there are no lines existing at all in the greater scheme of things. And I think this big picture is something that uh, you also find with the presidents of the Parapsychology Foundation. They are able to get a very expansive point of view on parapsychology and the cosmos in general, rather than a very narrow and restricted point of view. Thank you, Stan. Of course, Parapsychology Foundation was much more than just its uh, uh, presidents or whatever, and we owe a, gr a lot of gratitude to workers in the field. I'm wondering if I mention a few names, you might uh, have some memories. Of course, there was Martin Ebon, our first administrative secretary, Alan Angoff, who for many years worked with Garrett, wrote a biography of Garrett. Uh, there were our various librarians, and of course, uh, more up-to-date, uh, Dr. Nancy Zingrani and Dr. Carlos Alvarado have been of inestimable help to me as I run the foundation. Well, of course, I have very warm memories of Martin Ebon. He was a marvelous writer. He even wrote a book about Joseph Stalin's daughter, which was a valuable addition to the political literature. He did some wonderful anthologies on parapsychology. He took notes from, I think, half a dozen different uh, annual meetings of the PF and coalesced them together into a very rich and resourceful book. He was a good editor. He was intelligent. Uh, he was delightful to talk to. 
Um, I was an elder of Spencer Memorial Church in Brooklyn when I was living in New York City, and I had him out to uh, speak at one of the Sunday morning gatherings, and people just enjoyed him so much because he was able to present parapsychology in a way that was both in tune with the spiritual emphasis of the church and also in sort of a lighthearted, humorous way, which uh, appealed to the people in the group. And he was present at so many of the gatherings and did such very hard work on behalf of the foundation that uh, you're right, he was one of the foundation blocks of the foundation and really contributed a lot to the legacy. Now, Alan Ongoff, I also enjoyed very much, and he was very solid in terms of, uh, from everything I could see, in terms of his organizational skills, in terms of his financial decisions, in terms of getting conferences smoothly going, in terms of being in charge of various task forces. And Alan was just a little bit more serious than uh, Martin was, but then the projects that he was doing on behalf of the foundation had to be serious because um, they sort of provided, shall we say, financial backing, organizational skills. He also was a pretty good editor. He edited some of the uh, volumes of the, of, the, of the conferences. So again, that's a very, very happy memory of me whenever I, whenever I think of Alan. So speaking of the memories of other PF workers, do you remember any of the librarians? There were Brigitte Babusas, Wayne Norman, uh, I think one of your students, Joanne McMahon. Oh yes, I remember people who worked in the library. One of my students who got her PhD at Saybrook University was Joanne McMahon, and she did this wonderful dissertation on experiences that funeral directors had with uh, um, noises, sounds, voices, sights um, in the funeral homes something that they very rarely talk about, of course, it would spoke, spook too many of their customers out. But she did a very nice dissertation in terms of surveying the funeral directors, and that eventually led to her position at the Parapsychology Foundation Library, where she worked for several years. Also, I remember Laura O'Terry, who was not only a librarian, but a very, very sharp and discriminating uh, investigator of the literature and she was early on one of the people who got interested in quantum physics and when I told her about the work that uh, was being done with subatomic particles this is something that really interested her a great deal and I had one paper on the topic pre-publication that I gave to her and I think that this was responsible for some of the quantum physicists who came. The paper, by the way, was with Helmut Schmidt, and his random event generator has now gone through a couple of iterations, but its standard procedure is a technology to use in parapsychology. I know you're also uh, associated quite closely with Dr. Nancy Zingroni, who was our international uh, IJP journal editor and director of publications for many years, and also her husband, Dr. Carlos Alvarado, a noted historian in the field. So could you speak to them, perhaps? And well, yes, I knew Nancy Zingroni and Carlos Alvarado uh, back when they were first dating, and I had assumed that they were engaged, about to be married, and I committed sort of a faux pas. I had a friend visiting one of the Parapsychology Foundation meetings, and I introduced uh, Carlos, and I said, this is his fiancee, Nancy Zingroni, and he hadn't even proposed to her at that time. And so I was jumping the gun a little bit, and they take great relish in reminding me of that, and maybe I pushed their marriage ahead maybe a couple of weeks or a couple of months by this premature introduction, who knows. Anyway, they've had a very happy marriage and a wonderful partnership, the A to Z uh, 
Alvarado to Zendroni uh, company does a lot of work on behalf of parapsychology and Carlos is just a wonderful bibliographer, a wonderful interviewer. He did one of the best interviews of me that ever, ever has been done on parapsychology. And Nancy is a superb editor and she has done editing work for me. So the two of us, um, the two of them plus me have been in constant touch with one project or another over the years. And Carlos, of course, is from Puerto Rico. And I have visited Puerto Rico many, many times. I like Puerto Rico very much. I like the ambiance. I like the people. I've been there for conventions. Probably will be going to a convention there next year. So we can speak a little bit in Spanish whenever we meet. And uh, it reminds me of his roots in Puerto Rico and my wonderful visits down there. Well, how did your association with PF help your research and by extension the field in general over the years? Well, how can I say it? The Parapsychology Foundation has been so helpful to so many of us. And for me personally, it helped me in the conferences by coming into contact with people I really wouldn't have met otherwise. Um, it put me in contact with Humphrey Osmond, who became a very dear friend of mine. I visited his laboratory when he was in Princeton, New Jersey, and I kept in touch with him when he moved to Alabama. I was in touch with him after his illness, and then we moved to Wisconsin. Cite him frequently, had many, many talks with him, and I never would have met him without his attendance at the Parapsychology Foundation. I can think of numerous other people, mainly from Europe, who I would have not had contact with had it not been for these meetings. Also, I'm very grateful to the Parapsychology Foundation for giving the original grant that launched our dream telepathy studies at Maimonides Medical Center. And I would still be there if the funds had not run out. But I had 10 productive and wonderful years there. And so, you know, I'm certainly not complaining. In this field, you, you just take what you can get and be happy when there is support to do one, one thing or another. I think that uh, even after I left Maimonides, the Parapsychology Foundation did give me some money to do a statistical analysis of the data I brought back from Brazil when I did a week's observation of a very special medium by the name of Amir Ahmadin. I've published a dozen articles about Amir. And he is very, very reluctant to have any experimental work done with him because he believes that his gift should be used for healing. And that's what he's doing now. He's retired from his job. And he's working very undercover and privately with sick people. But the interesting thing about Amir, he believes in touch with the so-called spirit world. And so when he's with a group of people, sometimes there'll be an airport or a strange object that falls down from out of nowhere. And so I went to Brazil, well, this is almost 20 years ago, with a physicist, two psychologists, a physician and a student who is very, very skeptical of this because, of course, we want to have a skeptical person along, too, that can try to point out other explanations. And over the course of a week, and this is all in the articles I've written, we had about 98 unusual things happen. We call them anomalous events. And I created a scale, one meaning no anomalous event worthwhile, and five meaning definitely anomalous or strange, bizarre, or unexplained. And then every one of these unusual things, we would have three people rated on a scale, and it had to have a median score of three to count as an anomalous event. Only a handful did not meet that criteria, four or five. The others were to some degree anomalous. Well, this was on a rating scale. Now, my student friend 
was off in the field much of the day recording the geomagnetic data with the only geomagnetometer in the city of Brasilia. And we took the readings from that and correlated against the degree of anomalous experiences and we got very strong, very robust correlations. The stronger the geomagnetic field, the higher the degree of anomalous experience. Now, there are people that claim that a mirror did these apports and these things falling from the sky through sleight of hand. Well, how could he, through sleight of hand, alter the findings on the geomagnetometer? Nobody's ever come up with that. And I think that this is something, of course, highly complicated, and it costs a lot of money to do the statistics the properly way. And even though we did the research itself on a shoestring, the big expense was doing the statistics, and that's when the Parapsychology Foundation stepped in and gave us a grant to finish that up. And now, as I say, there's a whole book about Amir in Portuguese in Brazil. There are uh, a dozen articles that I and my co-authors have written in various scientific publications. And one of Amir's feats was the stigmata. He'd start talking, even though he was born Muslim, he would talk about Jesus Christ, and you'd get bleeding from the forehead, from the hands, just like the old classical stigmatists, some of whom were complete fakes, by the way, from, uh, from Europe. And when it came time to degree of anomalous experience, my two colleagues gave him a high rating, but I don't think those are anomalous at all. I think that the people that exhibit the, sub, the uh, stigmata have highly attuned psychosomatic access, and so their devotion has them break out in places that they think Jesus Christ broke out. And this is all within the realm of what we see in hypnosis, in suggestion, in the blood being very close to the skin. And so I didn't consider that anomalous at all. My colleagues didn't, so this got enough to get that three-point rating that would put us into the ballpark of what we correlated. But you see, I think that many things that we consider anomalous today will eventually fall within the domain of what can be explained in terms of science. Yes, a broader science, a deeper science, an enriched science, but this is why I was so impressed with Laura O'Teary's interest in quantum physics because she had the sense that this might help explain the underlying basis for parapsychological phenomena. So, in addition to the camaraderie and in addition to the excellent publications and the meetings, yes, these are very, very specific benefits that I got personally from the Parapsychology Foundation. Well, before I finish up with one last question, since you were talking about anomalous phenomena, I think you shared in the cab this morning coming over to the interview that perhaps you experienced one this morning. So could you share that with us? Well, your viewers don't know my personal history of the last 24 hours, but Delta Airlines had a computer crash, and I have been in Denver for the American Psychological Association where I gave five papers, so I was pretty much exhausted. I got early to the airport about hearing about the computer crash, hoping I could get a plane to New York City, and they told me that uh, the flight would have a slight delay. So I went to the gate, I waited 10 hours, and I got to New York City 4.30 in the morning. Went to bed, I thought the only way I'll be able to make this appointment is if I wake up at 9.30 and I just don't know if I can do it or not. So I slept very, very soundly, and at 9.30 I got up, went to the bathroom. Oh, I just want a few more minutes of sleep. And I went into bed, and out of no place this voice came, you have an appointment. You have to be downstairs in one hour. You don't have time to get to sleep. I swear that was the same voice that Giovanni spoke the times that I heard him working through Eileen. That 
I don't know, but that's what came to mind, even if it wasn't Giovanni, even though it was part of my uh, internal self pushing me a little bit, uh, it was still a pretty loud voice, didn't come from the television, didn't come from my telephone, uh, didn't come from the um, television or the, um, or the uh, telephone. So that's pretty anomalous to me. And without that, this little interview would have been delayed indefinitely. So I'm grateful to whoever woke me up and kept me going. Well, we are too, but uh, I am amused because Garrett uh, in later years always said, don't worry, I will be around, I will still be in control. So I think perhaps we'll take it as uh, her leadership still stirring the pot. So in conclusion, um, Stan, what in your opinion is the lasting legacy of Parapsychology Foundation with perhaps your suggested philosophy of approach for successful guardianship of that legacy? Well, I think the guardianship has been very, very stellar across the generations. And I think the Parapsychology Foundation is successful on that. Now that the Parapsychology Foundation doesn't have Francis Bolton or anybody like that around, and now that the stock market is a little bit unpredictable and investments are chancy and I don't really see any great uh, success in the future, I think the Parapsychology Foundation has to add to its legacy. I mean, let's face it, the Parapsychology Foundation has visitors to its wonderful library, has a treasure chest of conferences and proceedings, has affected many, many students who have come for knowledge and for interaction, has really been one of the few institutions in parapsychology that has lasted for 65 years. Handful of people have lasted that long. Handful of institutions have lasted that long. I think the question now is to see what can be done with the smaller amount of resources that are available. And you know better than I, but using the media, uh, social networks, YouTube, uh, Facebook, um, e-books, some of the wonderful documents that uh, the Parapsychology Foundation has can get out there and can reach even more people than in the past. Uh, YouTube interviews reach literally hundreds of thousands. It's incredible. And I think that there are other forms of media putting interviews on Facebook is a big thing that can be done now. These can often be done at very, very minimal cost. So I would say that uh, one of the duties of the PF is to explore the social media and the educational media and also see what partnerships can be made with educational institutions in terms of giving continuing education credit. One thing the Parapsychology Foundation has done over the years is not to restrict its conferences to strictly to parapsychology, but to invite speakers in, invite points of view in from mainstream psychology, from quantum physics, from anthropology, from sociology, from uh, librarians, for example, people from the business world, even people from the government. Find as many allies as are available and pick allies that have outreach, that have contact with the media, and this will keep the dialogue going. If, the, if there are counter explanations or criticism, so much the better. Enter into a dialogue, and again, that will get exposure and publicity. So we're living now in an information era. And I think that the Parapsychology Foundation can take advantage of this information area, which is now characteristic of the 21st century, and do outreach to reach even more people and at a minimal cost because communications are now expanding so rapidly. And the use of the internet, the use of computers, heaven only is what we'll have in the future to spread information. But let's make sure that the parapsychology is at the forefront as it has been in other areas and with other means of outreach. Well, thank you very much, Stan. And of course, 
the success of the foundation is lent very much to the caliber of the researchers through the years that have been uh, in the trenches uh, that we've tried to pull you out of. So I can't thank you enough on behalf of the field of parapsychology, Parapsychology Foundation, and three, possibly four generations. We thank you very much.